Hello and welcome everybody to a special edition of Magic in Mind, um, Teachings from the World Tree, where today I have two fabulous, spectacular guests, the lovely Kate Gillard and the lovely Laura Dalligan. And we are going to be talking about, we're going to be talking about um, the divine feminine in the Northern tradition and specifically these sort of four groups of the divine feminine that um, recently I've had quite a lot of questions come up from people about who are the Nornia, who are the Dysia, who are the Asinior, who are the Valkyrie and how do they all work together? How do I get to know them? You know, all of those things have come up. So I thought, well, I'll invite Kay and Laura to come and, and, and have a, a conversation about about those four groups because I do think it's really important within the within the northern tradition in particular this sort of collective feminine and we're going to be doing it in a very specific way so when what we're not going to do is we're not going to sort of parrot to you things that you could go and find on uh, wikipedia or on um, on the search engines or even in some of the really lovely books that are out there about them we're going to be talking about our own personal experiences of working with these four groups and the distinctions that we've drawn about them. So this is very much about personal gnosis, to an extent, and um, direct revelation of working with these four groups. So I'm really excited to be sharing this. There's so much that we could say, so we're gonna be very, very strict. I've given strict instructions that we're talking about the most you know, juicy, powerful, potent experiences at, the, at this point that we want to share with you. And then we're gonna be talking about at the end, an opportunity for you to come and work with us to have your own um, direct revelatory um, transformational healing experience with these groups as well so welcome Kay welcome Laura for those people who don't um, know us we'll just do a, a, a tiny little round robin to say you know sort of like how we've come to be at this at this point so for people who don't know me obviously I'm Maggie Rose Cunningham and I've been working in the northern European tradition since well since I was a teenager really and the um, the Dysia and the Norni and the AC Nyor have all been like really important initiatrixes for me during the course of my life. The Valkyrie to a certain extent, but I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. So that's why I'm here. Um, Kay, how about you? Um, I don't really work specifically within the Northern tradition or any uh, tradition. I work within uh, contemporary shamanism, probably more than core shamanism um, and it's very much a blending of techniques so I'm very interested in the place where traditions cross over mm -hmm. primarily I work um, as a healer which I've been doing for 20 years now as a shamanic practitioner and and Reiki master um, and there's more weird crossover there than you think there might be um, and uh, I have been practicing magic and devotional work within various kind of priesthoods for longer than that probably 25 going on 30 years um, and I like to you know creep about at the edges of these things and see where we can transform stuff and weave stuff together so that's why I'm here. And last but not least, Laura. Hello. Yeah, I'm I'm Laura Dalligan. Hello. And I've been teaching various uh, spiritual pathways and divination for the last <clears throat> 20 years, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, <laughs> when the maths get scary, isn't it? And uh, yeah, and also working in magical traditions and in the Northern tradition, amongst others, and the Celtic traditions around the same amount of time as well, 20 five years uh and i've recently completed my master's degree in viking studies and i have been kidnapped by the norse gods so send help <laughs> no don't send help I'm i think it's too fine. late it's it's too late once so it's now um, and <laughs> i yeah uh, particularly i've been writing about uh, shape shifting and in and that covers um freya uh, and also the dizzy and the valkyrie very very strongly in in that not the no near so much, but I have written a lot about cyber and fate in, in the course as well. So when I say write about it, it's it's writing, but also living it, embodying it and doing ritual around all these things as well. That is my happy place where academia crosses with magic and art, that beautiful space where you can go to the roots and find out what as much as possible could have been that flow that went on back then and we can tap into now and create through art, magic and um, write some great stuff alongside it. Yay! Very true. And I just love that we've got a collective of women coming together to talk about collectives of the divine feminine. Yeah. We all bring something um, different, don't we? And all of our paths have sort of crossed at different times. We've all known each other a very long time, haven't we? We've all known each other a very long time. And we're all used to being kidnapped by 
So let's talk about let's talk about the Norn era's kidnappers and um Laura, you're gonna come in and you're gonna swoop in if I say anything that isn't, you know, because I, I sort of feel like a bit of an imposter saying <laughs> but um so the Nornia, we've got the three like big Nornia, Orge, Valdandi and Skuld and then we've got the the baby Nornia or sort of lesser Nornia I distinguish them by saying capital N Nornia and little n Nornia and the the little Nornia were said to sort of walk among us, uh, almost like the messengers of the big Nornia. I always think it would just be like the three of them, they're just too busy. You know, they're there, the gods are visiting them every day, they're at the tree, they're doing all the stuff. They need some others to come and sort of help out and, and do the thing. And in the old text, they're sometimes thought of as being positive, sometimes negative. You know? And so we, we, we're going to float between that space, aren't we? A little bit of the like personal Nornia and, and the big uber Nornia. So I'm just going to... um dive in and say like for me like the Nornia have been really present for me in my work sort of almost from the beginning I would say of um, my sort of northern tradition work Oud in particular has always been a massive patron for me when we started doing our very um at the like the edge um save work okay you know Oud was mm. always the one who was like I am going to be your teacher and your patron um for this and they came forward for me very strongly when I started doing my shamanic work. And obviously I trained with UK and then we developed a lot of Northern tradition work together. And when I do a Drazzle's Path with my lovely groups every year, we always go to Urthusbrun. You know, it's one of the places that we always visit. You know, um, and they feel like, what's the word I'm looking for? It's a little bit like if someone stepped up and said, I'm following this path, I'm doing the thing, the Norna will say, oh, now we're going to pay attention. So you might have your personal Norna who are with you during your life and they'll you know, be guiding you and et cetera. But if you say, I'm ready to be, I'm ready to go onto the world tree, I'm ready to do my thing and be of service in that, then Urd for Dandy and Skuld will go, oh, but interested in them. And then they'll say, what healing does this person need in order to fulfill that destiny? And there might be past life regression work. There might be cord cutting work. There's a lot of um, reweaving, tapestry reweaving work that we go and we do at the well. And, and sometimes people's personal audio will come as well, but they, they act as patrons. And I have been doing that work with them for years now. And the only other thing I wanted to say for me about that sort of personal relationship with the Nornir is um, I although their names sort of mean like fate or destiny weaver or something like that, we sort of think. My understanding is that if you trace it back far, far enough, the word norn or nornir means um, uh, like mourner, someone who grieves. And I find that really interesting because it's a little bit like they're the holders of memory. So yes, they do the destiny of what's moving forward, but they also do the the, the mourning and the the keeping of, of memory. And uh, I sort of quite like that. I don't know how accurate that is, but it just felt true to me when I read it. I was like, oh, yeah, I can see that. So, so that's me with the with the Nornia. Well, who wants to go next? Who wants to dive in into the well? Never dive okay. into the well. People just <laughs> never dive into the well. <laughs> never dive into the well unless you're told you really have to. But yeah. even then, definitely do. We would never we do that. Yeah, do as we say, not as we do. I don't know. And um, I really like that. Um, that note about how they the nor the big norns they show up for the the big work the the things we're about to do that will fundamentally alter the the texture of our tapestry as we go forward i feel like sort of the little nornir I get very little sense of them actually. Um, I, I feel that they're around, almost they feel like attendants. Um, and I can feel like they're they're around and like maybe they are sort of doing the little edge work, you know, no matter how stupid or pointless the decisions are that I'm making. Whereas, you know, both with Andy and the schools are not gonna raise their head for me doing a stupid thing again. Like they haven't got all day for for all my all my <laughs> all my stuff that's not really the real thing but they do I think really show up when we do something that is fundamental or something that's foundational and for me that's in both senses of that so 
the foundation that we were brought in with the really core stuff i like that idea of the morning because it's like um carrying with us um the the sort of the deeper scars and you walk on you still have them uh, mm -hmm. And so anything that you're working with that comes from, you know, I, in my work, I come across a lot of generational trauma um, and, you know, just the things that whether we think it's past life or just pre-verbal conditioning, all that sort of stuff that's like deep dyed into some of the like main threads, anything we do that like works powerfully with that, the big norms are great for that, but they're also good for foundational decisions that we make for weaving going forward. They care about that. I do find that they um, will give, for me, they give advice very strongly um, and will say very specific things like this is the thing you need to need to do. But I am, you know, perhaps over those years, I'm quite committed to doing the stupid thing instead and saying, well, actually, I understand that you've said I have to do these three things together, but I'm just going to do the bits that I like um, and then I'll be back in five years or so to complain that this hasn't worked and they just go find whatever i'll see in five years and go back to their work you know like they what they say gets to the deep core of things but there's not a lot of you've got to really work to understand what they say because what they're speaking about is so deep that what they say for me seems to be stripped back and quite stark yes the the way that they speak and the advice and guidance that you get in those they don't have time to like fluff it up a little bit for you um, so it takes time to learn what they really mean and they really mean what, what they say. And so kind of dropping into that is important. And I find that they are, because I don't think they are quite deities, really. I'm not sure they would want to be called deities, but they are to be approached as deities, in, in, in my opinion. And devotional work will help to kind of decode that and understand what it is. So I did like a year of devotional work years ago now. I can't even remember when it was, probably 10 years ago or something. I did a year of devotional work to Vathandi in particular, which is really hard because there's nothing to read about her. It's very little written about her because she's really hard to pin down compared to the others. Mm. Um, so a lot of that was, yeah, personal gnosis. You know, it was a lot of just things being shown and again she is the becoming and the present moment so for me that's such a powerful place to sit because although it carries everything that came before and everything you do in that present moment makes every difference to what comes afterwards and that's very healing that's very much what healing work is about that's how we operate in in shamanism but that's tough to sit in because we're so attached to the past and the future so I have found um, Bathandi in particular for me has been really powerful in my own devotional practice. Um, I'm not sure she would be pleased with my my progress, but um, <laughs> it's, it's slow progress with those type of deities because they're not very human in a way that a lot of particularly the Norse gods are very human and mm. the Nornir are not. Yeah, I think you're right. There's because there's a vulnerability, isn't there, about the Norse gods? You know, they're not they're not um, immortal. They're often carrying wounds in a way that the Nornir sort of aren't. <laughs> they're just like you could. They're they're like primal forces, aren't they? Really, mm, in these yeah. days. I think what you said was really interesting. That um, people can struggle a little bit with them because they can be really stark and really mm. like do this. And sometimes it's really, really deep, and meaningful. And sometimes it's like, no, literally just do that. And you're like, oh, do I really want to? Whereas there are other deities who will be, they will woo us. Yeah. You know, they're like, oh, come and work with me and it's going to feel lovely and all of those things. And I wonder sometimes whether the Norni get a bad press because of the fact that they don't have, they have no interest in wooing us whatsoever. <laughs> they they have, uh, you know, zero PR game. They're not interested yeah. in any kind of marketing. And you know that idea that the gods exist and are empowered by our worship, so they'll come in with the flowery and the gifts and stuff. I don't think the Norns are empowered no. by no. us. No. I feel like they are doing the, the you know, the structural, you know, the, the business of putting a universe together. They have no interest in in that. It's my feeling from them in a way that deities can come in with the flowery language and the shiny and, and mm. you know, the norns don't respond to that. They care about the weaving. As you say, when you're about to do something big, 
then they'll pay attention because that is your reweaving your little bit of the universe. And that's that's all they care about, really. Yeah, they will help and they will heal. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Say, you know, I need you because they don't, you know. Yeah. You remember what <laughs> state we were in as we arrived at our ritual, at our healing work we did we did in February on Imok. We but all three of us dedicated this time to the Norns, and we all had gone through full on experiences just before that. And we all arrived like, hi, oh, oh. <laughs> particularly me. To be fair, I was I was the most discombobulated of all of us. Um, but we we realised I think that we'd focus this energy, and they were like, right, we'll do the bloody work then. And, you know, I got told I had to clear my house out like an hour before getting to the like. No, Scold was like because I was channeling and embodying Scold, who was a bit more chatty you know, because she's the younger and the and crosses with the Valkyrie. She's out and about a bit more abroad. Um, but she was like, get your stuff out of your house now. I was like, no, I'm going to workshop now. I was like, okay, now, now, because basically my things were in danger. And so we all arrived at this space with like, wow, okay, we've just been through the washer. And it's like, if you want to put on this workshop, and this is why we're doing it again. I'm joking, I'm joking. <laughs> um, then, um, then you're going to do the things that are, really put in your because since then I feel so much clearer so it's a good thing believe me guys it's at home who are watching this it's a good thing but on the day we would we just gone through it um in, in different ways different levels maybe even depending on the the norm that we were working with we'd gone through our own initiations to get there and that's when they were like we'd obviously got their attention they're like if you are going to do your RPR work for us then you're going to look you're going to not mess around you're going to do the thing and clean and clear and we, so we did. We <laughs> did. Um, and it was, yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. I'm like, expecting Ooh. to have my face painted like black or this, this is not in my, you know, in my scheme with sort of weird eyes and things, but you're right. And I think that's worth saying, isn't it? For people who are thinking, oh, I, I already know from what people, you know, that I want to go and I want to experience what is being talked about here and come to the next um, retreat in February is that when you do that, it does start a healing journey, doesn't it? It is, yeah. a, it is a sort of invitation to the non ear to say, no, I'm ready, I'm ready to step up, I'm ready to do that clearing. And they will support you in that, but you can expect like you know, life-changing things yeah. to occur in the run-up to that happening. It's one of the reasons why we're also doing pre-retreat work. Yes. To support people in that, I should say. Um, and as well, oh, sorry. I just want, sorry, I didn't mean to um, interrupt you. I just want to say, if, is there anything more that you wanted to say about the Nornia specifically? Um, a little bit, a little bit. And I, I totally get what you're saying about the the depth and the just sinking into this deep primal energy. And I was thinking maybe that's why the gods meet with them for counsel, because maybe the gods can decipher it more than humans can. <laughs> you know, it's that in, they, you know, the, the gods go to them for counsel. They have a different wisdom to what the gods have. It's, you know, they can show you those deeper, powerful threads. And yeah, you know, our lives are, are you know, they're a day's work for, for the Norns. <laughs> you know, that they, they cover vast aeons. So yeah, our lovely decisions, which are often, you know, silly and very important at the time, very passionate, don't bother them. Which, like you said, we've got our little Norn is. Um, they're not little, obviously the little ends. And they, you know, it reminds me of, of fairy tales of of um is it sleeping beauty it's when easy. the when the fairy yeah. godmothers arrive at the baby's um crib and then they offer them and I think that that's a remembrance of the Nornir in fairy tales that they arrive there and they put blessings upon the baby um and or maybe not blessings depending on who's grumpy um and and having a bad Nornir is written about a lot in the text like oh you've got a grumpy Norn like it was your character was like meant and there's so much moaning generally by men oh my Norn is so grumpy oh you know my son died because my Norn is grumpy all that kind of thing and I'm like no maybe it's because you're grumpy you know but um uh, <laughs> that feeling of the you could of course blame them a lot for what which we're not going to be doing but kind of that more personal connection that maybe they're a part of, of your personal not personality but the way your luck and your life moves forward and that's what we're really working with on our retreat so I think that's what I wanted to add Thank you, Laura. And I think no, that's so important. And I love, I agree with you. I do think Sleeping Beauty in particular feels like a um, yeah. a remnant of a much more ancient. Um, yeah. Thing. And I do in actually. In lots of different ways, obviously. But yeah. Just with the... Lots of different ways. That one that comes up. And uh, the 13th fairy. I was, you know, I, I think about it. And every time I do a retelling of that story, it's so clear that the 13th gift is the most powerful. Mm. Is, is the one that is the life-changing one that changes you know everything and that the you know the sort of gifts of like beauty and singing and dancing I sort of think they might have been added later a little bit yeah 
that actually to have a an amazing life you know, an impactful life, a life where you gather in wisdom doesn't always mean an easy life. You, know? you can't sing your way through. Well, we do sing our way through that, but you know, <laughs> we do actually you have a sing, way you sing our way through that. <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, it might just be that, you know, if you think about soul contracts now, we, we sort of talk about soul contracts, don't we? And so we sort of say, oh, you know, I, I, I committed to this beforehand and now I'm working my way through it. And I sort of think that the Norna held that energy a little bit, you know, that, um, you said that you wanted to have this healing experience through the course of this lifetime and if it requires you to be grumpy in order to do it and me to hold the energy of grumpiness for you I will do that is sort of what the Nona is saying thanks so much for blaming me for it <laughs> don't feel a bit like it, that it's so much about how we feel about fate itself mm. there are some things that are predestined or specifically there are so many things that will not come into our our experience because it's not within the material and the situation that we've come in to do but there are so many ways for us to navigate that mm. like it's not predestined in the very very simple way oh well this oh you know everything happens for a reason stuff where you don't get any responsibility the norns don't hold no responsibility energy they just don't they're not here for that the weaving is constant it's every step it's every decision even the little things um and they might not show up for those little things but everything goes into the tapestry everything is there so it's our uh, it's it is fake but it's also active and that's a big part of what our retreat's going to be about like how we navigate that how we work with the threads that we've got so we can make changes within what we're made from and what we came here to do and it is it's it being able to have a relationship with fate and luck and destiny through working with your nornia is incredibly powerful mm. Mm. thinking about the um the fairy godmothers this is where i think we start to get a bit of blending and blurring between the nornia and the disia yeah so we'll move on to the disia now so the disia are broadly speaking seen as this sort of feminine ancestral circle often seen as being like mothers grandmothers like stretching back not always they can they, they do blend in the in the literature quite a lot into like you say sometimes into the Nornir. the word sort of means like lady or woman but again if you trace the root all the way back it's thought that it might mean sort of nurturer or nourisher or suckler always makes me think of Aud Humla, the sort of primal cow who sort of nourishes all beings indiscriminately. She is just giving of the love. And that for me is the distinction between the Nornir, who are the giving of the purpose, you know, the giving of the destiny and the, and the Disir, who are like, and when you need a hug, I'll be there. <laughs> yeah. It's for me, where, and I know that you can get this where people say, oh, I have a, you know, a, a, a bad Disir as well but I've never experienced it that way. No. My, my Desir circle are a little bit like, you know, we talk about women's mysteries and how we've lost the rites of passage and those um, ceremonies that help us to move through life. My Desir circle are the ones who guide me through those moments where you, d you don't have your circle of elders to go and say, I don't understand what's happening to me. I need this. And, I need that. and they can guide in some of the, like the most intimate life moments and for me they are rites of passage moments where they come forward when I work with the birth runes I talk to people about the 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 birthing mother and her disease circle and I've done like birthing ceremonies and blessing ceremonies with people where we've invoked their disease circles and at death they come in and uh, I no that would be a lie if I said I work with the disease more than the Nornia but that's pretty on a par it's pretty on a par but mm -hmm. when I work with clients I always call in the disease you know, their circle, my circle, and I see them joining hands. For me, they're collaborators. You know, they collaborate and they whisper all of those things that you sort of wish someone would have told you. you know, all of that stuff is um, is what they embody for me. I'm going to go around the circle in a different way now. Laura, Ooh. what does the... Yeah, um, and sort of experience, um, as in when they first I first encountered the disease, though I did not know that's what they were, because I, I've always had a used to have a weird thing around ancestral work because I don't really know my family. I haven't got much family that I know about. So it's always felt a bit alien. Um, of course, I, and it's, all, it's always all to self as much as possible. But um, I had a really bad fever about, uh, I don't know, 
2017 2016 it was such a bad fever and there was no one around to help me and I was just like tripping my balls off <laughs> literally just I was absolutely just and uh I never and everyone else had that I mean I knew other people who had that illness at the time or around then and they had awful hallucinations I met my disease circle <laughs> And and they have stayed with me ever since. Like it wasn't just my hallucination. They were very strong and they were very protective. It was a time when I felt really vulnerable. I wasn't in a great living situation. And I, I just, I, I sunk into this space and then they were there all around me. Um, and they held the fort all night as I was in my fever. They were around me with a, with a, with a fire. They, they were keeping away bad spirits or bad people that were, you know, they were on it and they were singing in the language that I still don't quite know, but sounds slightly Eastern European. Um, and I, it was just beautiful. And then the next day I woke up and still in a fever, they went straight back there. They were still there and they held me for about three days, hmm, three days in that space until I came out of the fever. Um, and I was just like, it was transforming. It was absolutely transforming because I'd never had that contact. And now since then, I still didn't know it was my disease. I just knew they were mine and that they were looking after me and they proved it like in such a strong way. And for someone that's always been quiet, oh, my moon, it was like, wow, I am not, I am held. And I've called on them, you know, before I knew they were disease several times and they've warned me about things that were very immediate in effect. They've told me that don't do that. Oh, oh yeah, right. So they've always been so active in their support, which was a real discovery for me. And then when we started working more with the Northern Tradition, I was like, ah, oh. and they've just grown and blossomed from that recognition as well. Since I've allowed them to come in more, they've just multiplied. And and yeah, it's I think a, a lot, well, I do, and maybe you guys do as well, often have chosen goddesses to work with who are quite harsh. <laughs> <laughs> um and uh so actually having the disease like you say maggie you're like it's okay i mean they, they take no shit they're like do not do that i'm like okay yeah. okay when well, you say that I, I won't do the thing um but when but when i you know they, they hold that space and to expand my heart in a way to know that i'm held by them has just been such one of the most amazing gifts actually so that's mm -hmm. my story with the disease Oh, I love it, Laura. I love it. And it's certainly like so many people that I've spoken to when we've done work with the Desir who are so undersung and need to be out there in the world more and people need to have access to them. And just to be clear as well, um, although there's sort of an embodiment of feminine ancestral energy, um, all humans have a Desir circle. We And we know that from the literature. It's not like only women do all yeah. that at all. Everyone has them. Um, we need them. You no, know, we really need them and they offer such um comfort. And um, you know, I remember standing in front of the doors of the of the hospital and I had an appointment and it was one that, you know, I was dreading. I was absolutely dreading. And I had a moment when my body froze and I literally couldn't move forward. I was like, can't move forward, just can't do it. And it was the, probably the most um like powerful, like in the moment, little wizened old woman just sort of like appeared next to me. And she was like, you can't get through because you're holding that stone. And I looked, and I was like, hold this, you hold. So I was like, this is enormous. And, I was like, and she, she was like, I'll hold it for you. I was like, you can't possibly hold this stone. She's like, I'll hold it for you. Give it to me. <laughs> Do not mess with me. And I just sort of like gave her this stone. And she was there underneath the stone going, go oh, on then. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and it unfroze my body. And I walked through and I was like, wow. You know, she wow. just like, wait for me. And honestly, she's never given it back. I randomly go and see her and I'm like, do you want me to take this? And she's like, oh, I'm fine. Thank you very much. At some point, she'll take it back. And um, the other thing I truly believe is I believe that there are living members of our Disir as well. I think that we can have, you know, you can be a member of other people's Disir circles. If you offer that mm -hmm. support and undivided love, then you're absolutely mm -hmm. a member of their Disir circle in that moment. I just hijacked your space there, Kay. Kay! No, no, because it flowed so, so perfectly. Yeah. Um, I'm starting to like fall into shadow here, but I've decided <laughs> to stay in it. I'm not going to put the light on. I'm going to speak to you from the shadow realms uh, for dramatic effect. Um, <laughs> <laughs> for the for the desire, I the most common way that I use them, um, I actually, I have always used the term and sort of qualified it by going, oh, well, I'm no expert on this, really. You should speak to a northern practitioner really it's not you know because it's the only word I know for it that covers that exact thing so I always kind of say oh this has happened but but it happens all the time with my clients 
so often when I work with clients and I was going to say that as well not not exclusively female clients male clients as well particularly young male clients sometimes I work with um you know teenagers or you know sort of people that are quite young particularly people who quite often uh, the sons of clients and healers that I know right um and I always feel the deceit come in for them and it's part of I don't do it as part of my general practice and um, you guys know I operate on the basis of like core like contemporary principles of shamanism that cross over lots of different things but I don't work within my beliefs or my traditions really other than that I, I try I work with whatever the traditions of my clients are so if they're Buddhist then that's those are the chants that we'll bring in or you know if they're precesses particular deities so I don't call in the desire as part of my standard and most of my clients don't work within the northern tradition but sometimes I'll get this strong thing really quite frequently and I will call in the desire for those people and talk to them about it and then they go off like needing to um you know I've had people think oh I, I, I looked up the desire thing you said that's massively transformative for me and like oh there was one person in particular that I worked with I think it was last year might have been earlier this year it's quite recent um and we've not met in person it was remote work that we were doing she's in the US and the Desir stuff came through for the soul retrieval and they're really good for that sort of work the Desir mm -hmm. quite often come in when you're doing soul retrieval work soul retrieval being a huge part of of my practice um and you know I she was like no I don't know anything about that you know went off and looked it up like I was there for the experience and felt it but was you know oh I want to go learn more and she came back to me and said, this is a game changer for me she's like this is me exploring my heritage you know yeah. which a lot of you know people of European descent are in America and their roots into shamanism are tricky right because they're on other people's lands other people's traditions are there and it's hard to trace their own but she was like I've been doing this work about my ancestry and this is really you know so it, it people can feel it really powerfully but I always go well I don't really necessarily work with my desire on a regular basis but here's the thing that I do not literally every day I'm not super religious about it but most days when I'm you know in my practice I'm working I've got stuff going on Generally speaking, my morning routine is I will have coffee and morning pages, Julia Cameron style. Then I do a little bit of Reiki, Hatsure. Um, and then I do, I call it shamanic sitting or when I'm feeling particularly Southeast London, I call it talking to my dead nans, right? And it is basically <laughs> me going into like an astral space where my dead nans rock up. And I literally do, it, it, it's, 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 advice for in the moment like I'll go in and sometimes I will go in and be like I've got these two traps that I could go down today which one and they will always show me they will always tell me the answer mm. to that yeah. um and the women in my family they're mediums I did some work a couple of years ago researching my great great grandmother who was like tea leaf reader and palm reader and all of this and did all of this work. it really transformed my relationship with my mum to a certain extent not that we had a bad relationship but it really reconnected us with this lineage that we have and it's really since then and some other ancestral work that I was doing that kind of really linked me in with the dead nans and actually if that's not to see a circle business then I don't know what is exactly Absolutely. And, uh, you know, we can have very intimate relationships with particular members of our Desir circle, or we can feel them as a collective and we don't see them mm. and neither is right or wrong. But uh, I but have both, it's... actually. There's some that step forward and I'm aware who I'm talking to. I know that it's a direct ancestor, but there are lots of ways to become part of your spirit collective. There are lots of ways for us to leave legacy. It's not that you will never get to be part of a Desir circle when you're when you yourself are a dead man, you know. If you don't have you don't have children, I don't think that precludes us from being part of that, you know. No. And and there's so much spirit legacy and and energetic legacy that we leave behind and lineage that we create out of our work, but also just other ways that we're bonded together in each other's lives. So yeah. I think some of them for me, I'm like the dead nans is kind of what I call it, but there's all these others there and I don't know who they all are. Mm. I mean, you are literally one of the fairy godmothers for my second son. 
yes did yeah. the ceremony for him and all of those things so you're you know, a member of his decision circle whether you like it or not but <laughs> I agreed to it at the time. Yeah, I did insist on being called a fairy godmother, as did the other fairy godmother. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking about the, the Disney, what we haven't touched on, and we're going to touch on it briefly, is um, Freya, because Freya is called um, like Vanna Dees, isn't it? It's one of her titles, mm. or Dees of the, of the Vanir, which is um, like the, the Earth Gods. And, and that's quite a nice um, segue, in a way, into the AC Nior, who are possibly of all of these groups, the one that people will go, oh, I don't know what that name, what that word means the most. So Freya is an individual, but she is, she really does, for me, personifies a huge amount around the energy of the Dissia. Um, I'm doing an apprenticeship with her at the moment and she's like really sort of opened up huge aspects of my Dissia circle to me. And that whole thing that you said about soul retrieval, I can feel soul retrieval, I can feel power retrieval as well. And Freya is so tied up with um, with luck and Herminia and Megan and life force energy. So you know, she really personifies that and brings that in. So we're going to be working with her through the retreat as well. So we're going to be doing some like personal collective Dissian or near work and some more um, individual like, sort of deity focused work. And the AC Nure are probably what you would think of more classically as as deities. Um, they are it's essentially it's the feminine noun plural the feminine plural of the Aesir or the sky gods and so Frigg who is the, the queen of heaven is said to be the the chief of the Aesir and the Aesir are like her her handmaidens her collective feminine deities and I have to say I didn't work with them a huge amount for a long period of time I worked with individual you know, um, mm -hmm. members of the Aesir, some of whom happened to be feminine. And then Frigg uh, became the patroness of my work in runic astrology and the birth rooms. And she was a bit like, she said to me, she said, do you really want to do this? And I was foolish and naive. And I was like, yes, I really do. I really do. That would be great. I really do it. Like, life's work there. Just like, <laughs> it's one thing. And she, um, I did a whole right, whole ritual. And she worked with the halves of the AC Nior to add them into my the, the work that I do with the birth runes and runic astrology. So I had to do a lot of devotional work for um, 12 of the AC Nior. There are more than 12, but, uh, and they're becoming really important to me in my life right now. But I think they are more, I can now go and work with the goddess Na, the messenger goddess, um, who happens to be a member of the sky goddess goddesses. Um, what would you what would you add to to that in terms of people's understanding of the AC Nior or how they might work with them individually or collectively? Open the floor, Hood. Whoever wants to respond first. Well, I like that. You know, I was just thinking too in um, what Snorri said that it was pretty brave of him to say that they are as important as the AZ in that particular time. Like obviously to us, you know, we are very aware that, the, that these feminine powers are as important as like why wouldn't they be? But that to say in the 13th century <laughs> that, the, that, you know, that they are no less powerful than the gods. I think it's a mm -hmm. testament to their, even though they're not written about them, we get them listed, don't we? We get them listed, yes. the um, the handmaidens of, of Frigg and the other goddesses. We don't get to hear all of that much about them. And we do rely on our own personal gnosis mm. and we do rely on the stories we have, which are very limited, to get to get us moving with that. Um, but that the fact that that, that, that is written there, that you know, okay, I might not be able to tell you more about them because I might get burned. But at that time saying they were, as I thought was just like that, just proves there's a weight and a strength and an extreme power to them that was still being put at that at that point. So uh, yeah, I, I haven't worked many times. I have worked with some of them and connected with some of them. It's, um, if I start going on that journey, then I'm like, oh my gosh, what am I getting into now? <laughs> I've only mainly worked with Freya um, out of the goddesses and Ethan as well. I know she's not one of you know, uh, Ethan was someone that I really uh, a goddess yeah. I really really connect with, uh, and um, yeah, and Frigg a little bit. But I've started through Frigg to go there, and that will be something to journey more deeply into later. But I think it's you know it's such a life's journey. It's such a wonderful journey to kind of connect with all these different goddesses and rediscover um, these different aspects of the divine feminine in the in the northern tradition. So. Uh, I've not got loads of stories to share about them, uh, but uh, yeah, I think that it's a worthy and exciting task to start connecting with them more. And uh, yeah, yeah, no, I, I would agree, and I think it's one of the reasons why you know, much as I didn't know I was taking on at the time, 
when the birth rings work is important to me because you can go and you can say okay um looking at this hearth you know my um, hearth around um initiations or my or my relationship with wealth or my you know, way in which i have um, my relationships are governed which one of the ac in your is my patroness for this and that's a way in mm-hmm. creating relationship with them which like because we know so little about them we have to have those doorways that sort of you know open yeah. and, and, and and they invite us in and i do think they invite us in I do, and i think that like you know we have the list of them but that is also a doorway to so many more divine beings isn't it as well so yeah. there's because i've definitely through the journeys i have done with them there's there's so many more there that are and they I don't know their names exactly and then it may not even be they could be elves they could be the goddesses but they've taken me on journeys and I don't know their names but they are very um show yeah. me different realms and different spaces to explore and that is a really good point actually isn't it and I know that I've, I've read lots of other people's um personal experiences of working with these goddesses and a lot of times people will say oh she's definitely she's she's an elf or she's a giantess you know which is quite cool I think that the that the ace <laughs> yeah. Who are supposedly like the sky gods in this particular group no totally bringing in other other, other what's the word beings into yeah. their collective and having I'm trying uh, to collaboration. <laughs> yeah yeah sorry i was add my giantess is a sexy <laughs> we'll get on the t-shirt are. i think <laughs> so sexy. <laughs> they are yeah they're not like the lumbering oh, viva. No. No. no 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 oh. <laughs> Powerhouses of magic and hotness. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> Anything That's to add? Also to a t-shirt. That's also a t-shirt. Also a t-shirt. I, I feel as if a, a divine and a member of the AC and might have actually sort of jumped on your shoulder there and be like saying, I need t-shirts, I need this, I need that. <laughs> Not working for free here. <laughs> yeah, I have very little to add to that, really. I, I'm very much in the camp of like, I'm not really sure exactly what that means. Um, I do find it interesting that it brings in this idea of the handmaiden um, because as a priestess of Hecate, there is a lot of that companion energy, handmaiden energy. There's those um, images of her being the handmaiden to Kybele, to like this sort of older, sort of um, more primal, sort of earthy deity and, and still as being... There is something about the energy that I think embodies something about priesthood itself, which is service and, you know, being an attendant and being a guide and being a companion on the road. And and so there's something about that that ties in with these other um, traditions, ideas of, yeah, the attendant, the handmaiden. And for me, that, that comes up a lot in my other work. And um, so it makes me think of that. But in terms of the deities themselves, I think probably the only one I've done significant work with is Freya. Um, And I think the reason for that is because I'm a priestess of Hecate and every priestess of Hecate that I know, if we want to do anything that comes into, you know, embodiment or something that is very much about the sort of vivid um, experience of being alive in a human body, um, Hecate gives very, very few shits about that. She's not interested remotely in, you know, how you feel inside your own body, unless it specifically is going to interfere with your work um, on the edges at the threshold. It's all threshold work. Mm-hmm. And all of my work really is threshold work, you know. So um, all of us that I know that are priestesses of Hecate have other deities that we go to if we want to do anything <laughs> relating to our body or pleasure or sex or anything like that you know anything that's sort of very very human very physical and I think a lot of us that do spiritual work energy work healing work it's a tough aspect of the work to do is that idea of being embodied Mm. I know so many healers and so many because you can be a great energy worker and and totally sidestep being in here you can, you know, overlay a pattern almost that will allow you to do very powerful work without being fully embodied. And that's, there's a cost to that, but it's entirely possible. And I think a lot of people in a spiritual path do that. And so for me, the Freya connection is so interesting because she wishes for presence. It's yeah. an essential, for me, it, was, it my experience of her is that it's, it's about like, no, 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 you will be here no matter what it feels like. 
you can't change what it feels like until you will sit in this and not all deity work particularly the kind of threshold edge edge walking stuff that i do um really allows for an exploration of that and even the norns mm. themselves mm. they don't they you know they're big picture stuff freya will be there for the for the small picture for how it feels to be in it and cares about that really embodied aspect of moving through our lives as priestesses and as and as women as people presumably she cares about that for men too i don't know maybe she doesn't um but for me i very much felt her as mm. she's been so and i've kept it was a couple of years ago i did that work with her and i've i've always kept an altar to her since then yeah because mm. it's, for me she is a real guide and a real sort of bestower of wisdom and medicine about just being present in a way that other deities haven't been for me yeah um, yeah definitely she's also got me into gold and it's very expensive i was always a <laughs> silver girl no. like all my jewelry was silver totally. and now i can't have silver i have to have gold it no. can be like it doesn't have to be real gold but she does like real gold I'm like have you seen the prices of real gold <laughs> you know uh, so yeah. i now just constantly have to get gold things it's like it's changed a whole you know it's yeah but i think it's, other goddesses wouldn't really care about that so much like yeah. Yeah. Wear gold. I, yeah. uh, I started my friendship with her last year and it was exactly that i had to, <laughs> literally she gifted me some jewelry that i had, didn't even know i had which is quite nice not all of it oh. but it's helpful yeah, yeah exactly this <laughs> gold is apparently what i'm wearing for the last year i was like, okay thank you this is the time it's the most expensive it has ever been i was like <laughs> really? um, but also she's been you know she's um you know, in the crafting and creating she's a patroness of of beauty and, and crafting and creating and she's been mm. really inspiring with poetry as well she's definitely behind i also said it's in the text she likes loves poems but love can be literally anything love for the land love for it doesn't have to be love as women like love and love poems you know it can be that maybe the pains of love and the you know as well as everything else as well so she i find as a patroness for poetry and for your own creative practices even before i ever started working with her officially <laughs> if there's such a thing um i was asked to channel her for art twice that was about 15 years ago so she's always there I was like okay you can create from me you can create me you can bring my image or words in and uh, she seems to yeah has been very inspiring around that mm, yeah she has look we're gonna we're gonna, we're gonna have to do another session on Freya I can feel it because it's, yeah so much that yeah. we can play there I'm, I'm certifying as an embodiment practitioner next um this week this coming weekend in fact Ooh, my whole thing has been dedicated to um Freya so yeah, yeah. I really feel her and No, I had a beautiful segue and it's gone. It's gone. And Freya's like, no, it's just about me. It's me, Freya, Freya, Freya. <laughs> but I actually, no, I tell a lie. So I wanted to go back to what Kay had said about collaboration and service, because I do think actually that's really important. If you think about the AC Neural, there is a sense in which for them, maybe less than the Nornir and the Disir, if you have a particular problem, then you can go and find one of them who's going to be like, yeah, I can, I can help you with that, you know. I, I can help you with, uh, you know, I want to, I want to learn about meditative spinning, <laughs> or I want to communicate better, or I'm struggling with um, social interactions, and there will be a goddess you can go and work with. So I really love that, but they do embody mm -hmm. that um, collaboration and service, and I think that's a medicine that we need as a, as a like humans need right now, where it's all about individual power and competition, you know, and they're like, really, no, you know, you can, I can be totally in my power and be in service and be a handmaiden and allow yeah. myself to be that to another goddess and it does not diminish me and I find that really interesting mm. and it brings me on to our final group and I'm going to come back to you Laura because you mentioned um schools and the Valkyrie I think mm. it was yeah and um so I'm yeah just gonna hand over to you on the Valkyrie yeah what uh, yeah so I've been Doing a lot of reading around Valkyries and of course embodying Skuld in our last retreat, uh, last workshop we did was uh, an experience. <laughs> no, she's brilliant. I, I, I love her. Um, it's interesting with Valkyries because they are also so elusive and shifting over time. You know, when you read about them, it's all war and battle, war and battle. Uh, and, and their names are pretty, you know, bloody and gory. When you translate their names, it's all like, 
you know, Shield Shatterer and Warp the Cry and Battle Screen. You know, there's, they've got their their names. They're not pretty good. And of course, there's different ways of seeing them that you can see them as nowadays. They're also pretty and um, et cetera, et cetera. But before, you know, in some poems, they're absolutely terrifying for people. So you have this absolute vast of how they may appear to people and also um, their roles have shifted. Now, uh, I feel like they predate a lot of the official Norse god structure that's my feeling the way we know it now um and it's it's the whole thing of Odin displacing the Valkyries and taking over I think that there are different there's a different slightly different no work together but slightly different and because you've got Valkyries coming from all over anyway and um I did uh, the dogs around the dogs are are kind of getting involved with this um (laughs) but looking at (laughs) the swan maidens in Volnskriva uh, they seem to relate more to kind of um, Arctic nations, and where the when the swans' migration would would have meant fertility and life returning, and and they were also relating to swan goddesses who are mothers of their tribe. So I found that really fascinating. That for you know for years and years later, up until almost modern times, people would celebrate the swans returning because the mother brings back fertility. So you've got so many different things under the word Valkyrie. Mm. um but now we just go she is this hot battle maiden that's going to come and take me away when i die and i think that's kind of the the teamy version really um (laughs) uh, of of kind of the deep magical powerhouse wisdom keepers that are the valkyrie and the way i really relate to them the most are you know you see them in the the picture stones um to the gotland of of offering the mead uh to the fallen warriors or to odin when he comes uh and People get annoyed, you know, all women just bartenders in the afterlife. You're missing the points, you know, that this is the precious me that brings you eternal life and memory and remembering of who you are. And I love that aspect of the wow. Valkyrie of offering that, which is very Freya as well, of offer and, and giantess like as well. So you've kind of got the crossover there of um offering the gift of memory of, of your soul, uh, as after you pass or at different points on your journey. So there's so many, I think Valkyries get put in this little, but I think they're crossed over with the other, you know, with the Morrigan and there's also the Furies. There's all these kind of crossovers there, but I think they represent this older bird goddess powerhouse of wisdom keepers that have been put in a little bit of a corner. That's my TED talk. Mm. Oh, I love it. I, I'm just going to sit there with that. No, I have nothing more to say. Totally there. Um, you know what it made me think as well when you said it, it brought me back to what you were saying at the beginning, Maggie, about a possible origin for the word Nornir about being mourning and this idea of being given the memory of the life that you had just lost, tying in with that oh, idea of mourning as a as a mm. as a celebratory as well as a sad thing, like holding all of like keeping hold of the threads, isn't it? So really, when you were talking, it really made me think about that. Mm. I can really feel that, and. Um... With Valkyrie, it technically it doesn't mean it's like chooser of the slain, yeah. but it almost feels as if it's a uh, we've got it the wrong way round, and there's something where we go, oh, because then that means I have to be slain, rather than yeah. it means I'm going to go on. You know, I've been yeah. chosen to um to to have that remembering. I've you know this, this idea of sort of leading a life that means that um you're going to have you're going to go on and do other things moving forward. You know. You're not just going to sort of dissipate and fizzle out because you are a force of nature yourself. And they're sort of recognising that in, in there. I could sort of feel that. Um, yeah, for me, the when they speak to me really strongly, it is that it says the swan maiden. It says the muse, which is obviously a different tradition, but it's this idea of the muse. And I sort of see them coming and saying, um, we need uh we, we need uh, someone like a specific person to take on this thing you know we can see this thing it's needed and we will fly out to the in the world and we will find the people who have the the strength or the courage or the idiocy you know whatever it is to to mm-hmm. do the thing that's required and then we will whisper to them and we will be their muses um so that they can birth this into the world and if they take up that um charge then they become worthy of being chosen later, you know, for whatever, you know, whatever comes, whatever comes next. I can sort of feel that energy in them. But to me, it is that idea of um, that there is something beyond the sort of chosen and that um, we, it might be a title, you know, a title that is bestowed for 
um, people or beings from across all different worlds who who step up when it matters. Yeah. I yeah. think what um, what yeah. I feel to with them. No. And recognize that in others. And I recognize that quality in others and come and say, yeah, I'm, I'm here and I'll support you and help you. So that's our exploration of these four different groupings. We've talked a little bit about the crossover and my crossover with the Nornir and the Disir and the Valkyrie might appear amongst any of the above and you know, all of those things, which I quite like. And I quite like that it's fluid. But um, I hope that people have found that really um, interesting and helpful. And also that we've put across how important forging a relationship for ourselves mm. with mm. You know, whatever you want to call them, sort of beings, is and how powerful and potent that can be for us in terms of our healing and our wisdom gathering. Mm. So we are running a two-day retreat on um, destiny weaving and luck making um, with the Nornir and the Desir. Uh, we've mentioned that Freya is going to be involved on the 1st and 2nd of February in Glastonbury, which I'm very excited about. And we are going to be doing some pre-retreat work too, to sort of get people ready, get their juices flowing, ready for what promises to be a really powerful um, experience. Is mm. there anything you would like to share with people about what you're particularly excited about? Yeah, we, we all have a tendency to get excited about everything I think we're going to be excited about everything every weekend I, I really like that we've decided to do the pre-retreat work so that people they'll be live um sort of in, in the in the winter they won't be sort of happening immediately sort of from sort of after winter solstice really and and before before Imolk um which is the first weekend of February when we're actually doing the retreat I like that people are going to get the opportunity to kind of delve into some of these things, not just from a looking it up or listening to us talk about it perspective, but have like a little bit of that embodied experience, mm -hmm. that sort of personal um, journey is starting to kind of get a bit of their own personal gnosis going and then have a space to take that where that can be the foundation of what we do. And people can ask questions about it. Perhaps people aren't used to doing experiential work and there's no barrier. That shouldn't be a barrier to coming to do the work. So we're kind of starting the process. So I'm excited about the fact that we're laying energetic foundation and they'll be live and they'll be recorded. So if you if you can't go, then um, that's a nice thing. And I'm really excited about, you know, this thread weaving thing is such a huge part of my own practice in terms of healing and in terms of um magical work and and it's it's moments of of transformation and the work that we did last time I was working with the threads and I'm going to be doing it again but in a you know for my part as it were um about working with like the really core threads that is sitting in that in between space between fate um, which is important for us to acknowledge where we came from, what we're what we're made of, and find this sense of purpose and power, which is what shamanic work is really about. You know, we should be empowered by this. It should have real impact, real change. A vision that's not just like, oh, you know, I saw the gods and now I feel all special. We should be able to. Oh, I saw this thing about myself that I have now managed to make a change. And what does that mean in a real sense? Mm. I'm excited about the transformative nature mm. of, of the work. Hmm. How about you, Laura? Yeah, um, of course, all of it. But <laughs> I'm I'm loving that we've got two days because last year we had one day sort of, and it was we've put so much in, and that we get to hold that space for more time to create, you know, this 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 environment, this space for for transformation for power for retrieval um i'm gonna be uh, especially in the pre-retreat work focusing on um freya with the vals hammer and the valkyrie so we're going to be going to those spaces of reclaiming that memory um and 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 working with not uh you know not no pressure everybody <laughs> but journeying shape-shifting journeying with freya because um, Val's Hammer, Valkyrie, you've got that, the same Val element 
you know, that chooser of the slain and that the, the but the but Val also means falcon. So we've got all those crossovers even in names, you know. So we're going to be working with 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 Freya and the Valkyrie to work on reclamation and tapping in to that wild magic. So I'm looking forward to that. But all of it, honestly, I can't even control myself. I mean, it's going to be it's going to be really beautiful. And last year, that the energy that was raised was so amazing, like the huge drum circle and the voice work that we did and the crafting work that we did. And the, of the oracles that came through from the Nornir as well were amazing. So and the rock opera that I came out with, you know, it was oh, it was it was it was wonderful. It was wonderful. We want to keep those elements, don't we? And then we're building, like you say, so that we can we'll do- miss the rock opera. But yeah, that's <laughs> we cannot control when the rock opera comes through. Um, and, and that will still be part of it as well, won't it? Not the rock yeah. opera specifically, but the uh, the singing and the drumming. Obviously, we're yeah. holding it and we'll be leading the ritual of it. But this was really born out of, at least in part, um, the the healing song circle work that we've done together for years now in various different um yeah, yeah constellations uh we it, it's it's about everybody coming together to build that song circle and bring that energy those unique um drumming singing circles those unique ceremonial experiences and ecstatic experiences they are shamanic experiences mm -hmm. that everybody gets to be a part of even though we've got the longer retreat and we're doing more work and more sort of a study is not quite the right word but you know what I mean there's an opportunity to learn more about the the things that we're talking about but we're not going to lose that kind of deeper sort of wilder aspect of the work this year yeah well, I would agree and I'm very excited that I'm going to be bringing the embodiment practice again with with Freya's patronage of that too which again is that sort of um, ecstatic in the body experience not the mm. theoretical you know which is um, which is exciting too so People can book and we've got the link accompanying the video. There is an early bird opportunity. So get in there early if you can. For, it's available until the 1st of November. And if you have any questions from what we have said, or if you're thinking, oh, mm. I want to learn more about this, or I want to know more about that, do get in touch. Because although, we, you know, we obviously we have a framework and we know how it's going to go, we also all go with the flow and what's needed and the energy on the day. And it is informed by the people who are there. No, and, and what they need as well. So, so yeah. reach out if you're like, you know, what you what Laura shared around the Valkyrie or what Kay was sharing around the like, power retrieval really sort of spoke to me. Get in touch with us and let us yeah. know because it, it is a collective experience that we will yeah. be curating yes. for you. So, we hope that you have enjoyed this exploration of, you know, what could have been a much longer piece, but we wanted to look at, you know, personal experiences and to sort of disaggregate those four groups and sort of interrogate that a little bit and to share with you what is coming up on the 1st and 2nd of February and that there will be things ahead of that so get in and uh, we can't wait to work with you yeah very exciting what to all thank you everyone thank you see you soon <laughs>